There's this judgment. Legislation and laws are written by the legislature. That is defined in the Constitution as their roles, and we are a constitutionally run government. So that's why jurisdictions are so important, and it is a kingdom principle. And this principle founded in our country, so what I'm doing, again, I'm going through some of the roots, some of the things that are There's underneath. judgment. Le oh, that was interesting. <laughs> Sounded like me. All right, so, so we're going into the foundations of some of these ideas that have led to our longevity and our success as a people. This was the first time it was Evan. I read it, but I didn't talk about it. The reason I didn't talk about it is because it talks to the issue of jurisdiction. And I wanted to be able to spend more time in understanding and explaining jurisdiction and how it fits into our modern system. But there's the scripture in Romans 13, 7 is render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. In other words, not everybody is due honor, not everybody is due tax, not everybody is due, but there's an appropriate response of respect and um, honoring the governments and the service that they provide. And so this is the idea in Romans that's conveyed. And the Bible really conveys a concept of basic law and order and that, and that evildoers should be rightfully punished and the, and the government is authorized with the lethal force to be able to execute judgment uh, on people who are committing crimes on the innocent. So I, I really spent time on that last week trying to explain that. But again, we don't want to be under any illusions here because essentially these things are a microcosm of what's coming. In other words, when we all face God and we end up in his courtroom, we will face judgment and there will be punishments and there will be rewards. It's just that simple. And the, but there's two courtrooms in, in, the, in the afterlife. There's the courtroom of Jesus, which is called the judgment seat of Christ. And there's the white throne of judgment, which is the judgment of the entire world. And then there may even be some other courtrooms, but the, but the fact is that if I'm in a, when I die, not if, but when I die, I want to be in the right courtroom, and that is the judgment seat of Christ, because then I have him as my personal attorney. And he's also the prosecutor, so I've got it made. So, we are to only honor officials insofar as is appropriate in their God-given role. In other words, he's saying you give honor as appropriate. Jesus, it's almost, uh, it's almost reminiscent of the words of Jesus where he said, when they were talking about taxes and so forth, it says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so Jesus was also making a jurisdictional statement. It was a very political statement, by the way, unless you, you know, because I hear people say, well, Jesus never messed with politics. It's actually not true. And I can sit down with you and explain to you how he was. He didn't mess with Romans he didn't rest with, mess with Roman politics. But he was in your face with the injustices that were in the pharisaical governments of Israel, the local governments. He was always having a scrap with them. And by the way, that is the role of the church. To be a voice of accountability to uh, government gone awry. So he says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. He's, re he's relating separate jurisdictions. He's talking about the role of the government versus the role of the church. Throughout history, throughout times, people have been confused about this. There are times when the church had way too much jurisdictional power within the realm of government. And it would go bad. If they had the power to punish with criminal and capital punishment, that is not the God-given role of the church. The church should not be in that business. I, I had a guy one time in my church years ago that he was, uh, he was molesting one of the kids in our church, not on our property, but in a home, remote house. And, um, and in the process, I thought to myself, okay, so biblically, my role as a pastor is not to bring... So right off... We contact that official. We have immediate conversations. I mean, we are in. And let me tell you, when church leaders and pastors who represent collectively hundreds and hundreds of people talk to a government official, the problem is we, have, we don't always do that. We're not always doing it. We're not even paying attention. And this, this government official, I can tell you, they were, they were backpedaling fast. And they're like, 
oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm doing. No, 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 don't misunderstand that. I am not, I am not supporting that. No, 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 no. And then we discussed it. We talked about his response. And it was kind of like, okay, we're glad with that response, but it's a trust but verify because they're politicians. <laughs> the Constitution respects this sphere of government versus religion, if you will. First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So I just wanted to read the First Amendment just because you can see it. You've heard it probably a hundred, maybe a thousand times. But the idea is that the church is not to be encroached upon. The church is not to be hindered. The church is not to be overstepped by the government. We are to be given and established clear and free, uh, uninhibited freedom in the United States. That is the statement of our Constitution. 1853. I'm going through a lot of stuff, and I know I'm kind of rapid fire, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover it. 1853, the House Judiciary Committee conducted a one-year-long inquiry when a group petitioned the government to remove Christianity from our government institutions. They wanted a purge. This is 1853, nothing new under the sun. On March 27th, 1854, the committee gave a report, and here's what they said. And it's just the first part of it. I'll read the rest. Had the people during the revolution a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution and its amendments, the universal state sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, but not at any one sect, not of any one sect. In this age, there is no substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the republic, and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. And then they thought about it two more months, and they added this. The great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The constitutional republic that we have in the United States is not a democracy. I know this is a rude awakening for a lot of people. They think that it's just a you know, democracy and everybody... You know, that's, that's one of the motivations. We need to abolish the Electoral College and all this. And they do not understand. Elections in the United States are 50 separate elections. You understand? So that every region has a voice. So it's not New York and California making all the decisions for everybody all the time. It was, it was so profoundly wise of the founders to establish this, this pattern of government. I, sometimes I scratch my head and I look at it and go, how in the world did they come up with all this? It's amazing. Understandings of jurisdiction, understandings of three branches, understanding of checks and balances, understanding the Bill of Rights and all this. It's amazing. So here's what the founders said about democracy. Are you ready? James Madison said this, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever found, I'm sorry, have, it's a little old English, so, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. John Adams, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes and exhausts and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. John Quincy Adams. The experiences of all former ages had shown that of all human governments, democracy was the most unstable, fluctuating, and short-lived. Benjamin Rush, who's the signer of the Declaration, he said, a simple democracy is one of the greatest evils. Noah Webster, who is the founder of, sought to be the founder of American education, he said, in democracy, there are commonly tumults and disorders. Therefore, a pure democracy is generally a very bad government. It is often the most tyrannical government on earth. 
David Barton from Wall Builders, a historian, conservative historian in Texas, Christian. He said this, a pure democracy operates by direct majority vote of the people. When an issue is to be decided, the entire population votes on it. The majority wins and rules. A republic differs in that the general population elects representatives who then pass laws to govern the nation. A democracy is a rule by majority feeling, what the founders described as mobocracy. A republic is rule by law. The transcendent values of biblical natural law were the foundation of the American Republic. Consider the stability that this provides in our republic. Murder will always be a crime, for it is always a crime according to the word of God. However, in a democracy, if a majority of the people decide that murder is no longer a crime, murder will no longer be a crime. So firmly were these principles ensconced in the American Republic that, every, that early law books taught that government was free to set its own policy only if God had not ruled in an area. And that is referencing Blackstone's commentary on the law, which every early attorney in colonial times referenced Blackstone's. The model of representative government was a biblical model. We see it so well articulated in Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 16, you shall appoint for yourself judges. Moses didn't appoint them. He said, you do it. You appoint these judges. In other words, you elect them. You decide from tribe to tribe on regional jurisdictions. You choose who your leaders will be, your judges, and your officers in all your towns which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes. They shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Noel Webster, again, I already referenced him. He says, our citizens should easily, should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible, particularly the New Testament or the Christian religion. So, you know, you read this stuff and you go, oh my goodness. We as Americans, I mean, so many have no idea. You can walk around Washington, you walk around Lexington, you can walk around some of these places where the monuments are, and you see Scripture, and you see appeals to God, and you see, you see continuously everywhere. Our Declaration, the Declaration of Independence, lays the foundation for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. From the Declaration, we have this excerpt. We hold these truths. It's a famous excerpt. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And I talked about that last week, but you see it in Lex Rex and in the establishment of uh, Samuel Rutherford, that, that the governed should have only governed by the consent of the governed. That is a biblical principle, and he lays out the case as a theologian back in the 1600s, prior to John Locke, who adopted a lot of those same ideas. Unalienable. Fancy word. What that means is it can't be taken away and it can't be denied. It is from God. It is not granted by the government. It is granted by God. A man is, uh, all men are created equal. We have a, li a right to liberty, freedom. This is an unalienable right. We have a right to life, including the unborn. This is an unalienable right for every human being, a right to life. And we have the right to request that we that the govern only govern by our consent, right? A lot of these things are kind of a dub because it's part of the American DNA, it's part of our fabric, but we have to understand that each one of these has a biblical root, and that's what Noah Webster was trying to explain. Yes, not all the founders were Christians. Yes, some of them were deists, but we have to understand the consensus of worldview at that time was a Christian one. And there was a framework of Christian values and Christian law like, like uh, Blackstone 
the attorney said, was it Blackstone? I'm sorry. Commentary on the law. So here, God is the ultimate judge and ruler of the universe. We are all accountable to him. Our nation is built around kingdom principles. And I believe that's one of the reasons we're so great. We're not so great because we're great. That would just be another form of racism, wouldn't it? Say, well, Americans are great because we're Americans. Well, we're just better than everybody else. It has nothing to do with it. We're just human beings in a melting pot. I mean, if we were to survey and find out where we all came from, we came from all over the world. Just two, three, four generations back, we're from all over the world. Within the framework of the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence was the principles laid down for the emancipation of the slaves. Everyone knew it. Now I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you what my message is going to be next week because I think we've got a lot of really bad information about emancipation of slavery and how it came about and who was responsible for it and how did it happen. And it is a powerful story and is a testimonial to on fire Christian, passionate Christians who never gave up the fight. And we're going to look at that. And the title of next week's message, I got it in my prayer walk this morning before church, the truth about the emancipation. Many other laws derive from biblical principle. Immigration laws. The whole idea of elections. Capital punishment. Whole bulk of family law. Private property laws. Self-defense. The ancient rules of self-defense are also a part of our body of law. All these things were already in the Bible and often referenced in the Bible. In fact, I think the Supreme Court ruled, was it uh, uh, back about... Uh, gee, there is a second, a major Second Amendment uh, ruling, maybe 15 years ago or so. They referenced the Bible. They referenced they referenced the age-old common law understanding of self-defense and the basis of that, and referencing all the way back to the Bible. So these laws, many, so many laws, and there are some laws that have been taken off the books. The sodomy laws. Do you realize that sodomy up until 1970 was illegal in 50 states? Nobody thought anything of it. 50 states. Every single state had sodomy laws. In 1973, when the Supreme Court ruled, 48 states had pro-life laws. All eradicated by fiat in the Supreme Court legislating from the bench. We've been fighting like that was going to bring peace. We've been fighting ever since. So here's what we have to remember. God runs the universe on the unchangeable moral law of His government. One day we will all face His divine courtroom. Earthly governments are a reminder to all of us that He is the final lawgiver, king and judge to whom we must give account. Man, I had a lot of notes. I can't believe I finished. Maybe we should do Q&A. Just kidding. That'd be risky. Okay. <laughs> Let's stand together. America has lost its way. May we not lose our way because the church must remain a voice. And for us to be a voice, we have to be clear-minded. We have to know our roots. We have to know our history. Lord, we just thank you today. Coming up on our 4th of July that what a great privilege it's been for us to live in America. Lord, we just humble ourselves today. 
and just recognize that America is in great need once again of your gracious rescue. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. God, we just thank you for the cleansing from the renewing of our minds. We weep in our hearts for the bleeding of our country. Give courage to those leaders who are righteous and good and strong, that have clear-mindedness that understand many of the things that I've been relating this morning. Lord, we pray for those leaders that are in office, local, national levels. We pray for them that they would be strong and that you'd protect them and they would have wisdom of when to speak and when not to speak and when the right time is. But Lord, we pray for those of goodwill to have great courage. Do you guys have a song that's appropriate? Okay. We'll just take a minute. Let's just worship a moment. And... Thank you, Jesus. center of it all. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. And nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Yes, 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 God. Jesus, you're the center. Yes, yes, and everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. At the center of it all. So when I was talking about kingdoms and God's kingdom, you know, I mean, it's, it's possible somebody here this morning that, you know, the scripture says that we're transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And sometimes people are just thriving and living day to day in the, in the domain of darkness and they haven't really been transferred or they were and they go right back into the domain of darkness 
and they're under an entirely different reign and rule and government when you outstep God's kingdom. So I want to encourage everyone here just to say, man, whatever I do in this life, I want to make sure that I am on the, in the right jurisdictional arena. I want to make sure that I am in the kingdom of God and His jurisdiction. I'm glad I'm in the United States of America in our jurisdiction in the natural sense. The U.S. as a country has a jurisdiction, but God's kingdom has a jurisdiction. And it doesn't automatically include everybody. It includes us when we willingly as free moral agents join that kingdom and surrender and lay down our arms of rebellion. To say, I'm no longer resisting. I am a part. I am a follower of Jesus. I am walking with Him. we all a part of the kingdom of God? Are we all submitted as happy participants in His rule and reign? Are we, are we safe? Safe in His hands? Safe under His rule? So, thank you, Jesus. It's very possible we all are don't know all of you real well. Lord, I just pray for anybody here if they have been, sometimes we'll try to have one foot in the domain of darkness and one foot in the kingdom and it just doesn't work. The scripture says, how long will you halt between two opinions? Choose this day whom you will serve. And Lord, we want to be clear about what side we're on. We want to be clear that we're a part of your household. We're part of your kingdom. Today is the day. Today is the day. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. 